Hi, welcome to this Tuesday edition of Focal Point AFR Talk. Great to have you in the conversation today. Got a lot we're going to get to. We're going to talk about uh, immigration. There's an organization called the Evangelical Immigration Table. has a lot of names on it. You would recognize leading evangelicals around the country, and they have suggested an approach to immigration, which is basically amnesty, and I take issue with that. I've written a column today. It's up at Rightly Concerned. Dot com. If you want to read it, we'll talk about some of the content of that column, suggesting I think there is a more Christian way to look at the issue of immigration. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today, and I'll lay out some of my thinking for you and how it contrasts with what the Evangelical Immigration Table is uh, proposing, which, which in my mind is frankly nothing more than an amnesty piece of legislation. We'll walk all the way through that as the program uh, develops. A lot more of that we're going to get to as the program unfolds, so stick with us. Glad to have you in the conversation on board the USS Focal Point with us today. Now, in my uh, reading in the scriptures, I'm at the end of Matthew 16, beginning of Matthew 17 today, and we're going to pray some of the content of this section back uh, to God. Uh, This has two very familiar narratives in it, the story of Peter rebuking Christ and Christ saying to him, get behind me, Satan. Then there's the story of the transfiguration of Christ on the mountain. We want to learn some lessons from both of these stories. Now, remember, Peter, uh, Jesus had just said to Peter, look, you are Peter, you're Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I am going to build my church. And then he says, I'm going to give you, singular, you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. What you, Peter, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you bind uh, on earth will be bound in heaven. Or what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So clearly he says to Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. And you look at the first half of the book of Acts, that's exactly what happened. So every organization, every movement needs a leader. And Jesus is preparing for for his departure, and he says, look, Peter, I'm putting you in charge here. You're going to be the guy that's going to lead uh, the movement as my kingdom is planted and begins to expand. Now, Peter apparently got a little too big for his britches and thought that he could rebuke the Lord. So when when Jesus starts talking to them about the fact that he's going to suffer, he's going to be rejected, this bugged Peter because what Peter wanted is he wanted all of the religious and political leaders in Israel to love Jesus, to welcome him to the city, because that would mean all of his disciples, and especially Peter, would be in line for some kind of plum job in uh, the administration of this newly crowned king. Uh, And so when Jesus starts talking about getting flogged and spit on and rejected and crucified, uh, but that just upsets Peter, and he says to the Lord, takes him aside and says, look, it'll never happen to you. Now, Jesus knew where this thought had come from, and here, here's the important thing. And he, So he says, the first thing he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. In other words, Satan was speaking through Peter at that point. One of the things we need to be aware of is that Satan cannot read our minds, but he can project his thoughts into our minds. That's why we have to examine the credentials of every single thought that presents itself itself to our minds and is asking for admittance. We have to challenge the credentials of every single thought because Satan has the power to project his thoughts into our mind. Now, he can do it directly when we're just having, we're just kind of idly thinking and he'll pop some thought into our head. He can do it through friends. He can do it through the media. He can do it uh, through entertainment. Uh, He can do it through politicians. He can do it through teachers. He has a lot of different ways. Remember, the whole world lies under the control of the evil one, John says. So we have to be constantly screening the thoughts that come into our mind. So Jesus realized that this thought was not Peter's. It had come into his mind from Satan. So he begins by rebuking Satan. He sees Satan standing right next to Peter, feeding these thoughts into Peter's mind. He says, get behind me. I want you to get out of town. And uh, Satan obeys because he has to uh, obey an issue, an order that's issued in the name of Christ. So Satan gets out of the way, and then Jesus says to Peter, look, the problem here is that you are setting your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now what Satan's going to want us to do is to set our minds on the things of man. What God wants us to do, what the Holy Spirit wants us to do, is to set our mind on the things of God. And here's what Jesus says are the things of God. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man 
if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life or his literally his soul? Or what will a man give in return for his soul? So what Jesus wants us to understand, if we're talking about the things of God, what it involves is death to self. We pick up our cross. You saw a guy carrying a cross. He was on his way to die. So you become a follower of Christ. Then one of the things that has to die is self-will. Our life no longer now becomes about doing what we want, getting our way, pursuing our will. It now becomes a matter of doing the thing that Jesus Christ is asking us and directing us to do. And, and there's going to be, it's going to be risky. That's why Jesus says, if you lose your life for my sake, there will be times when you follow Christ where it's going to feel like you are putting every single thing on the line, everything that matters to you, everything that's important to you, everything that's valuable to you. You're putting all of that on the line because you're following Christ. Now, what Jesus says, that's going to happen. It's going, it's going to feel like you are losing your life, but that is how you find it. If, on the other hand, you decide not to follow the will of Christ, you don't pick up your cross, you decide you're going to save your life, you're going to do the things that you want to do, uh, you're going to find out that you will forfeit your life, you will lose uh, everything. So Jesus says it's worth the risk. Now, I won't take time to go into this, but at the end of this section, Jesus says there are some of you who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. A lot of people do not know what Jesus is talking about. A lot of speculation, but I think the answer is very clear because the very next episode is the transfiguration. And just some of the disciples went up with Christ to the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. That's what Jesus said. Some of you who are standing here, by which he meant Peter, James, and John, you will not die until you have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that's when he was transfigured before them. Face became dazzling white. His clothes became radiant, blindingly white. The voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved son. Remember, he's talking to Moses and Elijah. The voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And Peter and James and John, the, the cloud had descended on them. They don't know who's going to be left. Who is the beloved son they're supposed to listen to? The crowd clears. Moses and Elijah are gone, and they're standing by himself is Jesus Christ identified by God the Father as his beloved Son. Well, let's go to prayer. Lord Jesus, we affirm that you are the Son of God and that the Father loves you and is well pleased with you. We pray that you will reveal yourself in your glory to every man, woman, and child in our city and nation so that they all may come to recognize that you are the beloved Son of God and learn to listen to your voice. I pray this day for myself, for my family, for the listening audience of Focal Point and AFR Talk, for President Obama and all our elected officials, for every man, woman, and child in the United States. And I pray that you will make us aware of how easily Satan can project his thoughts into our minds as he did with Peter. May we not be ignorant of the devil's schemes so that we can reject his lies when they present themselves to our minds and so keep ourselves from being a stumbling block to you and your plans or to others. Please help us to set our minds on the things of God and not the things of men. I pray that we will learn to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you. May we be willing to lose our life for you so that we may find it. Remind us that whoever wants to save his life will lose it in the end. Protect us from forfeiting our souls in the pursuit of what the world has to offer. We pray these things in your name. Amen.